Father in heaven, that is our desire, is that somehow through these lives that we live here, that you would be glorified, that you would be seen to be the, the God of glory that you are, magnificent, full of splendor, radiating glory, Lord, that that through our frail lives, you would be seen to be a God worthy to be worshiped. How does that happen through us, through the way we live? It can only happen through Jesus Christ. It can only happen through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It can only happen through the power of your word operating in our lives. It can only happen by your indwelling spirit within us. It can only happen as we humble and yield ourselves to you, to your word, and to your spirit. Father, may what we do next in your word continue to be our worship and even an, an example of us humbling ourselves and yielding ourselves to you. We ask it in Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. And let's take our Bibles and let's open them up to Romans chapter 3, verse 21 is where we are at. We've been out of Romans for a couple of Sundays, and we are now jumping back in. I'm so grateful for John and his capable handling of God's Word the last two Sundays. It's very encouraging to be in John 13, so John, thank you for that. Really appreciate it. But now we're going to step into the next section of Romans, and it's thought by many to be... In all of Scripture, one of the most important passages in your Bible, Romans 3, verses 21 to the end of the chapter. And to set ourselves up there, I need to repaint the picture of humanity for us that Romans 1 through chapter 3, verse 20 paints for us so that we'll properly grasp our new section of Romans that we're in today. In Romans 1, verse 18 and following, it says that humanity is united together indivisibly in our sin and our rebellion against God, and that God is presently, now, expressing his wrath on the human race. Romans 1 makes it clear that we know the truth about God. That he is there. We know he is there. We know he exists. The testimony from Romans 1 is that we know he is real. We know he created us. And we know that he communicated himself to us through creation and even made himself evident to us within, his, within our own hearts. We know he is divine in nature. We know that he has eternal power that created everything. We know and understand all of this, Romans 1 says. We know he is glorious. We know that he is worthy to be worshipped. None of us are atheists. In fact, not even one of us is agnostic. Beyond every doubt in our mind is our knowledge and our awareness and our certainty and our understanding of the God who made us. That's the message of Romans 1. You don't hear that anywhere else except in the Bible. And what we have done with that truth and what we have done with that knowledge, that awareness, that certainty, that understanding of God is absolutely scandalous, according to Romans 1. We did and we do what is very unrighteous. That's the key word. It's unrighteous what we are and what we have done. In an act of despicable unrighteousness, we suppress the truth about God that we have received and that we do know and that we are certain of. We try to suffocate it. We try to choke it out. Uh, We try to squeeze the life out of it so that it can no longer have an effect upon us. And we have no legitimate excuse for doing this. We are without excuse, Romans 1 says, in our unrighteousness. And it's worse than that. It's not, not only do we just try to suffocate the truth of God, but in our unrighteousness, we actually invent evil lies and foolishness as alternatives to God's truth, and we cast ourselves on our lives, and we believe them. 
We foolishly speculate, all the while professing to be wise, Romans 1 says, as we vainly try to destroy God's truth and rest on our lies that we create. And in all of this, we're not anti-worship. We're not trying to end or kill worship. We're just trying to kill God. And worship anything else we can to spite him. That's the message of Romans 1. We're not sort of dead. We're dead. Any object of worship will do, by the way. Even something resembling a creepy, crawly reptile will worship if it slanderously will mock God. We'd rather worship something that looks like that than God. That is unrighteous. And that's the message of Romans 1. And God's response to that in Romans 1 is to put his hand on the back of our collar and judicially put us into our unrighteousness in a a prison cell to cast us into our unrighteousness. Romans, Roman chapter 1, its way of describing that is to turn us over. And three times God says that in Romans 1. He turned us over in wrath into the lusts and the passions that come from our impure hearts. He judicially turned us over into degrading, sexually immoral passions that end up degrading us. He judicially turned us over into a depraved mind that fills us up then with even more unrighteousness, Romans 1 says. And the message of Romans 1 is that God is presently revealing that kind of judicial wrath against us right now. And when I think about human life under that setting, it makes me think of human life operating in something like a prison cell at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath. Not in hell yet, but a hellish existence for us now. There we are. Here we are. Under the present wrath of God, Romans 1.30 says that we are haters of God and that we are inventors of evil. We're plotting the death of God if we can pull it off. We would do it to him again, exactly what happened to him 2,000 years when he took on flesh and came here. We would kill him again if we could. And at the bottom of this abyss of God's wrath in our prison cell of unrighteousness, we know we are deserving of the death penalty against us. But we don't care. We just keep cheering each other on in our unrighteousness. That's Romans 1.32. Now, there should be an obvious conclusion. And it's the one that Paul makes, and it's actually very simple. There, in the prison cell, at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, in our unrighteousness, there is not one interested in seeking God. Changing in order to please God. There's not one who seeks for God there except to kill him if they could, if we could. And then Romans 2 revealed to us that there are some, upon hearing this horrible indictment that grabs us all and just sums us all up as a a human race, there are some that hear this and are offended at being lumped in together with all of the rest who are that way. There are some who immediately, in their depraved mind, they make a distinction between them and the rest. They draw an imaginary line around themselves and they say, the rest outside of me? Oh, absolutely. They are worthy to be condemned under God's wrath. In fact, I agree so much, I'm willing to cast the first stone against them. But the truth in Romans 2 is that these actually practice the very same things as the rest, in their prison cell, at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath. There really is no distinction between any of us in God's mind. These who want to reclassify themselves have actually not distinguished themselves from the rest, even though they think they have. Their minds are just broken like ours. And they have invented another evil for themselves that is not true. 
And the way that they go about doing this, making this distinction about themselves in their prison cell at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath is to put some rules around themselves. To to try to distinguish themselves from the rest. To reclassify themselves that way. But the truth from God in Romans is that there's only one united, indivisible, whole lump of sinful, unrighteous humanity. And upon hearing that, we recoil. And we start making the case for how distinguished we are from the rest. I'm not like that. You can step into a maximum security prison and they do that with themselves. They try to reclassify themselves. Oh, I'm not as bad as those guys over there in that block. And again, this is done by adding religious law or some kind of moral set of system of rules. And God's conclusion is that there is no distinction between them and the rest, even though they hope to distinguish themselves with their moral rules. This is what we often do as unrighteous people. We try to reclassify ourselves as separate from the rest of the unrighteous lump of humanity. But the gospel in Romans 2 will not allow any individual, it will not allow any party or any nation at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath to reclassify themselves that way, to claim a distinction, a distinguishing reputation different from the rest. Now, the gospel labors to establish this very important bad news about us. Part of that bad news from the gospel is to actually hold you down and not let you reclassify yourself. God won't buy your reclassification of yourself. The work of the gospel is actually, we found in chapter 3, is to silence your protests against this. To close your mouth, to close my mouth, to close all of our mouths against this, before this horrible indictment. This is the work of the gospel in Romans, to bring you and to bring me into a silent awareness and affirmation that at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath that our unrighteous inventions of evil and hatred for God have actually merited his wrath against us. The work of the gospel is to silence our protests, to close our mouths. And if the gospel achieves that in us, when the gospel achieves that in us, then and only then, Will we be willing to see that hope lies outside of us? Only then will we stop any attempts at self-reform. And that's when we read these two precious words in Romans 3.21. They're as precious as the two words Denny pointed out in Ephesians 2, verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 21 But now, but now, but a contrast, a contrast to everything that has just been said in Romans 1, 2, and the first part of chapter 3, a stark contrast to the horribly dark news about me and about you and about all of us together, a contrast to our guilt finally arrives in this text, a contrast to deserved wrath is in this paragraph. A contrast to the heartbreaking grief of our sin is here. Relief is in this passage. Joy inexpressible comes from this paragraph. Let me read it to you. Romans 3, verse 21. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, 
Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe, for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. He's the one through whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What is our hope? As we sit in silence in our prison cell in the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, where is our hope? It is found in what we need most as unrighteous sinners. According to Romans 1.29, we are full of unrighteousness. What is the contrast to our unrighteousness? God's righteousness. That's what we don't have, and it's what we must have if our relationship with God is ever going to change. And now we hit the good news of the gospel. Your only hope, our only hope, as unrighteous ones under sin and under the wrath of God, is if God somehow no longer sees your unrighteousness, but instead only ever without fail sees his own righteousness when he looks at you. That righteousness is the only righteousness that he sees, that he accepts, and that he gives freely. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is ready to expound on this righteousness. We're at the heart of the gospel in Paul's letter to the Romans. We're going to take our time going through this passage to make sure that we get everything out of it that we must get out of it. I think there may be something like nine features I'm going to give you on this at some point in the days and weeks to come. We'll take three this morning, Lord willing. And that's what this passage is all about. You can see it. These are the gospel features of God's righteous status for sinners in salvation. The first gospel feature of God's righteous status for sinners in salvation is, number one, God's righteous status is found only and entirely apart from our works. Verse 21. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. But now, apart from law, there, there's no definite article, there's no the in the original before the word law, which means Paul is not specifically limiting himself here to uh, the Mosaic law in the Old Testament. Law here in this context actually has already been determined for us a verse above. Look at verse 20. Because by the works of law, there should be no article there either, by works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. So apart from law, apart from the works of law, that's the idea here. The meaning here is, is when an unrighteous sinner adds a system of religious rules to his or her life and then gets to work at it, apart from that, the righteousness of God has been manifested. If unrighteous sinners like me and you, like us, in our prison cells at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, if we think the way into God's righteous status is to add a set of moral rules to our lives, Romans 3.21 says God's righteous status does not come by that route. The only result of adding religious rules to an unrighteous life is that we sinners actually become more knowledgeable about our sin. Verse 20, right above that, for through law comes the knowledge of sin. We just become more intimately acquainted with our unrighteousness in the prison cell at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath. 
So the good news for us is, apart from that, apart from the addition of law or religious rules to our unrighteous lives, the righteousness of God has been manifested. If you want to see where the righteous status of God is, that he accepts and that he gives, if you want to see where that is found, you will not be able to locate it in any way or degree in the unrighteous sinner who has added a set of moral rules to his life. You won't find it there. Because apart from that, the righteousness of God has been revealed, manifested. When Paul says apart from the law, it's the strongest way he could say it. It's a strong statement of separateness. On one side is the addition of law or religious rules to an unrighteous life. And on the other opposite side, altogether separate from that, in a universe entirely different from that, something mutually exclusive to that, something that has absolutely no commingling with that, Over there is the manifestation of God's righteous status. In other words, the God who sees us all as unrighteous and under our sin and under his wrath, when he thought, you know, I'm going to reveal my righteousness, my righteous status that I give away, in no way did he ever even consider the fact that he would reveal it through our good works. It never crossed his mind that he would ever reveal it through our self-reform. The righteous status that God accepts, that God gives, that God reveals, has no interest in the way of law. God has a righteousness. He has a righteous status to give to sinners that they don't have, but that they must have if they're to be saved. God has revealed that righteous status. Where will you find it? Entirely and only apart from any religious conformity to religious law that you might attempt on your own. Now that says something massively important about how unrighteous we are how bad off we are, how far gone we are from God. Whatever touches our lives and whatever we touch is only stained by our unrighteousness. We will never generate a righteousness through good works that will ever reverse our separation from God. And this is something massively important about how righteous God's righteousness is. His unrighteousness is so far above, it is so exalted, it is so beyond ours, it bears absolutely no resemblance to any so-called righteousness that we might do. Here's the good news. God's righteousness, his righteous status can be found. We're in the the prison cell of our unrighteousness at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, and we can find it. And he tells us where it isn't first. We will just never find it revealed in connection with our so-called good works. Never. That is the first gospel feature of God's righteous status for sinners in salvation. It is only and entirely found apart from the works of law. I have a question for you. Are you hoping to make a contribution to the only righteousness that God accepts? Are you wanting to add a little something of your own to what God wants and has and gives? If you do, if that's the way you've been thinking, you are only guaranteeing that God's righteous status will not be revealed in your life. Because his righteous status is revealed entirely apart from law, from your works, from your contribution. So abandon completely any attempt 
of self-reform to gain favor with God. Abandon it. Because the only righteousness that God accepts is not found there. The second gospel feature of God's righteous status for sinners and salvation is this. The Old Testament testifies in agreement with God's righteous status in the gospel. Verse 21. This is being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. The God-breathed, inerrant, infallible, Incapable of falling, authoritative revelation of God that is the Old Testament. Sometimes the New Testament writers refer to the Old Testament simply as the law. Paul did that up in chapter 3, verse 19. Quite often, this fuller title for the Old Testament is used the law and the prophets. What Paul is saying is this manifestation, this revelation of God's righteous status, that's entirely separate from our good works, it is being witnessed by the Old Testament. That inerrant, infallible, authoritative Old Testament, it sees the revelation of God's righteous status apart from our use of the law. It's a witness to it. But Paul is saying more than it happened just to be standing there and saw this happen. What he means is the Old Testament looks over there at our works that we do from the addition of law to our lives. And the Old Testament, with all of its authority, it witnesses and it testifies that God's righteousness is not found there. Let me break it down into the two main parts according to this title. The law. The whole sacrificial system of the law in the Old Testament witnesses testifies in agreement that God's righteous status is in no way at all connected to the religious works that Israel did. The prophets, they are the ones who taught God's people. They are the ones who cried out to God over and over and over again to call them back from their rebellion against God. They testify also in agreement that God's righteous status is in no way at all connected to Israel's religious works. Do you know what this is saying? You know what Paul is saying in verse 21? This affirms that the Old Testament never taught salvation by works. What the entire Old Testament sees witnesses that the righteous status of God revealed in the gospel is entirely separate from works, the Old Testament agrees. It affirms. So understand this. When Adam sinned, when Eve sinned, and they crawled on the ground into the tall weeds to hide from the God they now hate, and they began to invent evil against him there in the tall weeds... From that moment on, the way to God's righteous status was never, ever, even for a moment, the way of law or good works. The Old Testament agrees with this. The righteous status that God accepts and that God gives in the gospel, the Old Testament witnesses, testifies of it positively. This is one, uh, one stunning way that your, your Older Testament and your Newer Testaments are held inseparably together. The gospel of Jesus Christ that reveals the righteousness of God. It's not a new religion that just came on the scene in Paul's day. This is the same old ancient salvation from God since the day Adam plunged himself into sin and ruin. You know what? Paul's going to get into this in chapter 4 about an old, old, old guy named Abraham and the way to God being faith only and a declared righteous status over the one who believes. That's the first book of the Bible. Now, 
Now, next week, Lord willing, we'll talk more about in what sense is the righteousness of God revealed if this is the way that it always has been. This is a little hint. It has everything to do with what God did through his son at the cross. There's a revelation there that is unlike anything that ever happened in the Old Testament. We'll get to that, Lord willing, next week. Listen, you can rely on your Bible. You, this, is, this is the part, this is the application of read your Bible more. Pray your Bible more. You can rely on your Bible from one testament to the other. You can rely on it to be dependable. It will be consistent in its message of salvation. Your Old Testament is not in conflict with the gospel of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. It's the same because God is the same in both. Strengthen your confidence in God's word. The third gospel feature of God's righteous status for sinners and salvation is this. Number three, faith in Jesus is the instrument through which God's righteous status comes. Verse 22. Can you tell me, Paul, something more specifically about this righteousness? Sure. It's even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. So this righteous status has not been revealed in connection with any good works, but it has been revealed through faith in Jesus Christ for all of those who believe. This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Look back at it with me. Romans 1, verse 17. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. I think what that means is from one person's faith to the next person's faith, that's where the righteousness of God in the gospel is revealed. Remember, just prior to this in chapter 1, Paul wanted both the Roman believers and himself to be blessed by each other's faith. Look at chapter 1, verse 12. That is, he says, I long to see you, verse 11, and be with you. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. From faith to faith, that's where the righteousness of God is revealed. This is what Paul is saying in chapter 3, verse 21. That is where the righteousness of God that he accepts and that he gives is revealed in the gospel. And Paul says in chapter 3, verse 22, for this is true for all those who believe. And what a, what a comfort. What an amazing promise. Every single unrighteous sinner in the prison cell at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, for every single one of those unrighteous sinners under sin and under the wrath of God, every single one who believes Jesus will find that his or her faith is the means through which God's righteous status is revealed in their lives. So where do you see the revelation of God's righteous status? Not over there where unrighteous sinners in their prison cell at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath have tried to add law to their lives. You don't see it over there. Where do you see it? Instead, you see it over in the other corner of the prison cell at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath where unrighteous sinners simply believe Christ. And the promise is that for all those unrighteous sinners who believe, the righteous status of God is revealed. It comes to them through their faith. So that begs the question, what is faith? What is faith? First of all, by the very nature of Paul's argument here, faith cannot be and is not anything like a work we do. It is nothing like that. If it was, then God's righteousness would not be revealed through it because it is apart from law, it is apart from works. Faith is entirely, completely, unlike, distinct from, mutually exclusive to any good work according to the gospel. It is entirely different. It is simply a means of receiving 
what God says he did. And even that faith is given as a gift by God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It is a gift. There can't be any boasting in salvation. So what does it look like then for an unrighteous sinner under sin and under the wrath of God in the prison cell at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath? What does it look like to believe? God says his righteous status is revealed only one way, through the instrument that he hands to me there, the instrument faith. And through the faith he gives, I receive it and I receive what he said. I take it as true. I trust that what he says is true. And for all who simply believe like that, God's righteous status is revealed through it. Think on this amazing promise in salvation. All you have ever produced in your life is unrighteousness. That is all I have ever produced on my own. That is all that has ever been emitted from me and manifested from me and from you. But simply believe Jesus Christ And God's righteous status is revealed in the midst of your unrighteousness. Revealed through faith. But if you abandon that promise and instead you decide to try to unite your unrighteous life and you try to do some self-reform and you add a set of religious rules and, and the only thing that will be revealed to you through that is more unrighteousness. Salvation comes through faith alone because God's righteous status is revealed through faith in Jesus and never through works that we do. And if God sees his righteous status revealed through faith in Jesus, even though we have only ever been unrighteous, God will see his glorious righteousness through our faith and we are saved. We are looked upon with favor by God. There is so much more to say about this in the verses to come. We'll say more about it in the weeks to come. But do you notice, lastly, as we look at verse 22, that faith has an object? Faith has a focal point, faith has a target. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in a person, in Jesus Messiah, the Jesus of Nazareth, faith in him. Listen, a faith that is all by itself only, faith for faith's sake, or faith that terminates in itself, faith in faith, does not save anyone. Faith that floats aimlessly is a faith that an unrighteous sinner will take to hell with him. But faith that is the instrument through which God's righteous status comes, it is a faith that is fixed on, fastened to, and clings to Jesus Christ. Unrighteous sinners who who like to talk about faith in faith or how important it is to have faith, talk nebulously about the faith community, but they never mention Jesus Christ as the sole glory of that faith, they do not have God's righteous status revealed through that bankrupt faith. And a religion with the wrong God that puts up faith as a virtue, a world religion, a cult, 
That faith rests in what is demonic, and no matter how sincere it might be, the righteousness of God is not revealed through it, and there is no salvation in that faith. Why? Because the faith that reveals the righteousness of God is a very specifically focused faith. It is one that lands in Jesus and rests there. But we need to tighten this even more because the New Testament tightens it even more. Faith in a so-called Jesus that only grants that he was, he was a good teacher or merely he was, he was a social justice warrior of sorts and I so admire him and I can believe in a kind of man like that. That faith is also fit for hell. We'll see more of this next week, but faith in Jesus Christ, it must receive biblical truths about this Jesus in regards to his redeeming death. Drop down to verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Is, are we, are we, do we get this righteousness through faith or are we justified through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ? And the answer is... Yes, your faith must be also tied inseparably to the redeeming work of Christ when he shed his blood at the cross and he made payment for and, and, and ransomed us from our sin. If you have a faith in a Jesus, but it doesn't include a ransoming blood-bought freedom, it is not a faith that will justify. And it must also be tied, verse 25, to the propitiation in his blood. That means the satisfaction of God's wrath in his blood through faith. Again, do you see how it's tied to faith? To claim a faith in Jesus Christ, but not really like the idea of him dying on a cross as a substitute or seeing that all as some kind of cosmic child abuse, is a faith worthy for the deepest parts of hell. Listen, you can come into the religion grocery store and you can find a whole section of faith. Has it ever crossed your mind that you need to make sure you have the right one? Even the demons, what? Believe. And they even shudder. And their belief goes with them into the deepest pits of hell. Have you ever thought about if you have the right faith or not? If you like the idea of faith, you know, believing in general about something that you can't see, I really can't put my finger on it, I'm not really sure about what to believe, I really, I really like the idea. Listen, God's righteousness, his righteous status is not revealed there. It cannot be found there because it is a very specifically focused faith through which the righteous status of God is revealed. It is faith in Jesus Christ, the one who redeemed us, the one who satisfied the wrath of God against us. Biblical faith, do you have that? Saving faith. It's not a general faith for faith's sake. It's not a nameless, aimless, faceless faith that, that just needs sincerity attached to it. It's not. Biblical faith, saving faith is rooted in the person, Jesus Christ. The one whose blood not only paid the ransom that you need so that you can get out from under sin in the prison cell at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, but the same blood satisfies, it quenches God's wrath because he took it in your place. Faith in that one. That one. Does your faith have him as the target? Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for giving to us a solution that is entirely, completely outside of ourselves. Thank you that though all we have ever been is unrighteous, there is a way to your righteous status. You've provided it. You've revealed it. It's there. You're not hiding it. You're a good God. You, you've manifested it out in the open. We don't have to go off to some high mountain in some faraway place and take some kind of mystical religious journey. We don't have to get some kind of strange decoder ring to read between the lines in a book. Lord, the words that were, they were just right here. They just, they just told us clearly and plainly where it is. It's revealed in the gospel. It's revealed through faith. From faith to faith, it is inseparably connected to your son. It cannot be peeled away, and your son can't be peeled away from his sacrifice at the cross, the shedding of his blood to redeem us, to satisfy your wrath against us. Father, thank you for revealing a way, the way, the only way. Father, open the eyes, soften the minds, the hearts that need to come to this even now, who perhaps have been hanging on to a faith that is worthless. They need this faith. Give it to them, Lord. Give them the instrument through which your righteous status comes. We ask it in Christ's name, amen.